Hi, this is Arnav. Welcome to the channel. Today I have Amrit with me. Amrit is the head of research uh, at Zilika, and today we are going to talk about the technical aspects of the project. So, hi, Amrit. How are you? Hello, 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 Arnav. Thank you, thank you very much for for bringing me to this show. I'm I'm very good. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Um, can you give a bit of a background and how you actually got into the blockchain space and eventually started working at Zilika? Sure. So, um. I mean, everything started when I when I was doing my PhD um, at Inria in France. So I was essentially working on privacy and uh, security of software systems. So how what happens when you use a software, let's say antivirus? What kind of privacy and security implications come into existence? As, especially, you know, the data structures part of it. For instance, let's say uh, an antivirus uses some special data structure, let's say hash table. What kind of impact does it does it does it bring? Uh, in terms of security and privacy, does the data structure is is a particular data structure more vulnerable compared to other data structures when you're using in a security context? So this is what essentially I did uh, during my PhD, and then I had a chance to come over to to Singapore where, and work as a postdoc at National University of Singapore, and this is where I started uh, to explore blockchain space. And again, I had this this uh, background in privacy. So um, at that point of time, Monero was very popular, and it's still popular. And at that point of time, it was kind of emerging, and I felt that this is one of those coins that needs to be studied from a research perspective. And this is where I started exploring Bitcoin and blockchain in general. And then we, you know, I collaborated with a bunch of authors in in, in Singapore at, at at the university, and we tried to analyze the privacy aspects of Monero. So this is how I I got involved into into blockchain and you know general. And how did you get into Zilika? Was it like through the Pratik Saxena group, or? Yeah, it it did. So I I was a I was a postdoc working with Pratik, and um, I was and once our project on Monero was kind of over, I was trying to look into different other you know other research topics. But suddenly, at that point of time, Pratik came in and he called me up and said, "You know what? Uh, we are planning to build a scalable blockchain platform. Would you be interested in working with us?" I said, "Yeah, sure." And this is how kind of I kind of jumped into Zilika, and then you know we started. Started to build the protocol and uh, started designing it. Got it. That's great. That's great. So, can you talk about like what are the what are what were the motivations in the initial days behind Zilliqa and uh, what are like if we compare it to some common blockchain like some Ethereum that is like the most popular blockchain platform and EOS. How does it compare out to them? Okay, so we felt that I mean it's it's not just me but you know the team um, which was involved with Pratik and around the around Pratik. And Pratik was working on um, on scalability, so he were, he had he and some of his co-authors had a paper called Elastico. Yeah. yeah. They built a sharding solution for for scalability. Mm -hmm. So I mean the 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 idea was there, the you know the research idea was there. It was shown that it works, but then um, you know somebody had to kind of bring that theory into practice. Mm -hmm. So there was a company, and there's still a company called Antran, which kind of took that uh, research paper. Into into consideration and try to implement the sharding idea now in a permission setting first, and this is I mean because Antron was a kind of a company, so you know they had their own clients and they wanted to build a blockchain infrastructure, and they felt that you know permission setting is something that that kind of appeals to those those clients, and so um, Antron built a private blockchain based on this paper by Pratik and his co-authors, uh, and that implement sharding. And the reason why we we had to go with sharding is because we felt that existing solutions for scalability they don't actually work that well. I mean, if you look at Ethereum for instance, uh, uh, it's, it's a public blockchain which has brought you know a different angle to to decentralized applications, but it's it's suffering from this scalability or throughput you know requirement that we, we <coughs> it can process around five to ten transactions per second. And if you ever want to build a real-world application, you know it, it suddenly cannot survive with five to ten transactions per second. But that's where the scalability comes in, and 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 uh, we implemented we first implemented it you know, in a permission setting, and then we realized that uh, this sharding idea kind of works only when you have a lot of nodes, and you can get a lot of nodes only when you open it to the public. Because if you open it to the public, people can join your network, and then the number of nodes can actually grow pretty quickly. This is not feasible in permission setting, and this is how we 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 decided to come up with Zilliqa as a as a public block, blockchain platform that can solve the scale the scalability problem. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is this is the high level idea of you know 
how Zilliqa came into existence and how and what problem we try to solve. In general, we have a, uh, we have a different kind of solution that you can imagine for scalability. You could you could consider uh, solutions like uh, off-chain solutions or side-chain solutions, which these are the solutions that give you very high throughput. They could even touch, uh, let's say, one million transactions per second. But they kind of, to some extent, they sacrifice in terms of security or decentralization. And there are other solutions, other class of solutions like, let's say, POS or DPOS or DBFT. The idea is that you don't want to run a consensus protocol across the entire network that can be really, really big. You kind of select uh, a small group of people, and only those small group of people can run consensus protocol and can agree on the next set of blocks. And there are a bunch of uh, you know, solutions or projects that are kind of following that, that direction. And again, you have some risks that come along with them. Again, decentralization, like, you know, and you ensure that, and how can you guarantee that the 10 nodes that you have selected uh, are decentralized enough? How, how, how do you prevent that? What happens when you kind of go and attack those 10 or 15 nodes? What kind of security you will get out of that? Zilliqa is trying to do a, a kind of a build a blockchain and on-chain kind of scaling solution without sacrificing security and decentralization. So you like people can build their state channels and all that on top of uh, Zilliqa, like off-chain, they, they can do that. Yeah. They can certainly build an off-chain off -chain or side-chain solution uh, on Zilliqa. There's, there's no restriction for that. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, you know, you, I mean, consider, consider any block, blockchain, right? And it has, it's, it's, it's going to have a finite number of, I mean, it can only handle, say, a finite number of transactions per second. I mean, even if it grows, let's say, in Zilliqa, you can grow, your transactions could grow linearly, but there's a certain bound. And beyond that, if you want to go beyond that bound, you need another line of solutions. Right, which could be a side chain solution or an off chain solution. But you tell that, you know, existing solutions, they don't actually go and hit and solve the on chain problem first. And they, they try to solve the off chain or side chain solutions first. We felt, we, felt, we felt that, you know, there's some scope of improvement on the on chain part, you know, on its own. And then you can certainly build any on chain or any off chain or side chain solution on Silica. That's, there's a possibility. Got it. Got it. So, can you like explain in brief what exactly is sharding and like how does the Zilliqa structure look like? Like an overview level explanation. Sure. So, um, in Bitcoin, I mean, if you, if you know how Bitcoin Ethereum works, what happens is that when you send a transaction, that transaction goes to a node and then it kind of gets distributed to every single full node in the network, and then every node that has received your transaction will process that transaction and then kind of agree on the final state of the system. And that agreement could be either through proof of work or you could imagine a BFT or any, any consensus protocol that, that you might have. So the key idea is that every single node processes your transaction. Now, it gives you a very high level of decentralization and security because if, if, if you have one node that goes off, your transaction will still be processed in a proper way. And, but you, know, you lose in terms of, I mean, there's a lot of redundant computation going on. And this is where the idea of sharding comes in. The sharding idea says that when you have, let's say, 10,000 nodes, you're not going to ask every single one of them to process every single transaction. What you'll do is you'll, you'll take this network and you'll divide that network into smaller groups. So let's say a group of 1,000 nodes, and then 1,000 nodes are only going to process a certain subset of transactions. Now, because every single node, node is not processing every single transaction, you can actually have higher throughput. So the more smaller shards you have, more smaller subnetworks you have, the better your, your throughput will get. So this is the high level idea of sharding. And like uh, more about the structure of how Zilliqa, so you have like this DS community and you have like the shards, how does that, can you exactly. explain that? Exactly, so, so, so sharding is an idea that works, that gives you high scalability, but how would you actually shard? Like let's say you have a node that comes in your network, how do you, I mean, how do you decide that whether this network is going to go in the shard number one or it goes to shard number two. Like, how do you decide that? And let's say if you, so this is where DS committee comes into existence. The DS committee is a, is a kind of a special shard, you can say, that kind of makes certain decisions around, around let's say, sharding. So it will say, okay, now that I've received a new node and that node is going to be assigned in a specific shard. So DS committee is more like a, so the overall architecture is like a two, two layered architecture. You have shards at the bottom, and then you have a DS committee on the top. The DS committee is kind of the, you know, the, 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 the manager, if, you, if, you, if I may say so. So it kind of dictates like, how things will be organized. 
how the shards will be formed, how transactions will be sent to different shards, and so on. It's more like a an administrative shard. So, like, how how did you? I'm just curious. How did you actually get the idea of like having this DS committee, and or is it just needed because you need to have this administrator which uh, is going to govern the rest of the shards? Exactly. I mean, so the main idea comes from again from Elastico paper where where they had this similar architecture. Um, so the, the the main idea is that let's say let's say you you have a node that comes in you need you need someone to decide right i mean you cannot just randomly say you know this guy is going to get going to get going to going to get into this shot that that decision has to be made by someone now you can probably pick one guy and say one node and say this is the person who is going to decide everything but then that becomes a central point of fear so you need more like a more like a bigger network a bigger sub network that makes those decisions so ds committee is just another name it's it's just another name for a special shot and you need you need a special shot to make such decisions so uh, can you walk us through like how does one uh, sample transaction look like in zelika so um when a tra transaction is let's say sent by a user like me it will have a sender's address and it will have a recipient address let's consider only payment kind of transaction right now so you have a sender address you have a recipient's address and then you have you know amount that you want to transfer to the receiver what happens is that what happens is is the following so when you send this transaction you will send to a, a node that kind of that's a gateway point to the network and that network will kind of tell you that look this transaction will be processed by a specific shard and that happens with uh, with respect to that's kind of decided with respect to the sender's address but let's say you have two shards and your sender's address ends with a zero then this transaction will be processed by shard number 1 if your sender's address had you know ended with a 1 then it would go to the second shard okay so now this is this is the logic that's implemented in the in the blockchain network now when you send this transaction it gets decided it gets assigned to a specific shard and then this shard will receive a you know other transactions similar similar to yours and then they will run a consensus protocol which is pbft and they will agree on the next set of blocks that we call micro block so they will say that okay in my shard i am going to propose the set of transactions for the next micro block and then there is a you will create this micro block and then you will have a header of this micro block and this micro block so every shard will propose its own set of micro blocks and then the header of all these micro blocks will go to the ds committee why it happens because you need a global view of the system right because you want to know like if you if you are in a if you are loading a specific shard you want to know what happened in in some other shard and that kind of that kind of information is kind of provided by the ds committee so every shard kind of gives a summary of the 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 micro blocks to the ds committee and ds committee aggregates all those summaries and then kind of transfers these information to different shards so that every shard kind of knows what happened in other shards okay um and how does like the uh, smart contracts uh, communication like say if one smart contract uh, wants to uh, in one shard uh, wants to communicate with another shard how do, how do, how does that communication work okay so um there are, there are different ways of doing it one is uh, the approach that many papers are following right now which is uh, excessive cross shard communication so let's say you have one sh one smart contract which tries to talk to another smart contract then they will have to kind of uh, talk you know you have to do do a cross cross sometimes a cross shard communication mm -hmm. we feel that there is there's something that can be done in a better way so we are currently working on a on a, on a solution that's that won't require cross shard communication at all so i mean the, the details are not ironed out completely yet i will be happy to share with you once 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 we are once we have our paper ready okay. but our, our our end goal is that we don't want to involve a lot of cross shard communication so that will entail a lot of traffic and uh, will lose in terms of performance if you okay so like say if i develop a smart contract um and i like go to the blockchain and push it so where on which nodes uh, does it like get stored it stores it gets stored everywhere so the state of the system is not divided so we are not doing state sharding so we don't divide uh, we don't say that look uh, this transaction has been pro processed by this shard so you are not going to take you're not going to just store the account balance corresponding to the sender and recipient so every node processes i mean every node stores this entire state of the system so if you if you send a smart contract or if you send a transaction to a smart contract eventual state of the the entire smart contract will actually be stored at every single node okay got it um so like 
talking more about the smart contracts like what are the what is the language smart contract language that you have developed okay so um, it's it's a it's a very interesting question because uh, i'm working on it right now and um, the point is that we feel that uh, ethereum has has given us a lot of things uh, in terms of you know the cool idea of having smart contracts the cool idea of building being able to build decentralized applications on the blockchain but the language that they have has certain issues I and mean, recently if you call like you know about integer overflow and things like that yeah. we had more issues in the you know in, in the past so we felt that there is there's something that should be done in terms of smart contract language security and and with that mindset we we decided to build a new language that we call silla so silla is a language which is kind of simplified or I, I could say more organized uh, than solidity so that developers you know developers can can to some extent the language will kind of eliminate certain kind of vulnerabilities that we see right now in solidity for instance you know reentrancy bugs things like that they, that won't happen in 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 this language so the the, the language has been designed with security in mind and uh, we are currently working on it so why not like use a normal language like java or all these like the common mo- what most uh, developers are already familiar okay. exactly so uh, we don't so silla is a language that we feel that it's more like an intermediate level language we don't expect developers to directly li- you know write in in silla so and we feel that you know you have a lot of sol- solidity developers and we don't want to make their life difficult by imposing a new language so we are going to build a higher level language that's going to sit on top of silla so the developers will write directly in that higher level language and we will have compilers that's going to compile from that higher level language to silla now um, we do understand that solidity is a very popular smart contract language right now so our how, our higher level language is going to be very similar to solidity so it's, it's just about building syntactic sugars so um, so we don't expect people to learn a new language so that's that's the short answer so so it's solidity or it's like something similar almost similar to solidity it's going to be, we cannot we cannot have the same we cannot it cannot be entire solidity because we are going to eliminate certain features from solidity mm-hmm. so you know we cannot support the entire language but it's it's either going to be a subset of solidity or or something very similar to solidity um, so like why is the language non turing complete and what are the limitations of it being non turing complete okay so let, let me clarify this uh, turing incompleteness and completeness first um, so solidity language itself is turing complete which means that you know it's it's just as powerful as let's say c java or any other any other language that you use in daily life and um, but yeah it it comes with with certain risks you know with dao and parity and things like that we feel that you know if you simplify your language uh, you can do you know you can you can still you can still be able to to build applications just as you know you will you would be able to build all those applications that you are actually building in solidity right now without sacrificing security number one uh, number two is so turing complete is and incomplete is doesn't really matter when your language is very expressive it may not be turing complete but it's it's let's say if if you're just below that level if you're just eliminating let's say infinite for loops mm-hmm. and you know there's nothing that that you cannot build Um, to be honest, you know, you can always build a real-world application that you're building right now on Solidity without using infinite loops. Okay, so practically, and, like it's the same. Uh, practically, it's the same. Even if let's say if you write a Solidity contract, right, and if you put an infinite loop, it's not going to run in real world, right, because of the gas block yeah. gas. Mm-hmm. So the Turing completeness of Solidity is not actually exploited in real world anyway. First of all, so you know, there's there are certain things that you know the Turing completeness per se doesn't really matter. what matters is how expressive the language is to some extent right. um so we we i mean and in our language you can still write infinite loops but you know, it's slightly you know twisted you can still like write infinite loops but you know there's 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 no sacrifice you're we are making in in in, in practical terms mm-hmm. got it um and like uh, what are what is like the front end library for for uh, zelica like in ethereum we have web3.js like uh we have something similar we we don't have it right now but yeah we are it, it going to be very similar like we could probably support the same same libraries that the theme has uh-huh. that, that should not be a big issue and uh like what's the service to like say you want to fetch data from the internet like we have uh, oracleized services in ethereum yeah so we 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 do have plans to build that as well 
and so we will certainly give some support and we hope that you know the community will will help us as well in in building the rest of rest of the tool chain so yeah we do have plans to to build oracle oracle like services uh, on on zero uh-huh. and uh, is how how is the like the migration can say i have a, i have an ethereum dapp or another uh, maybe say an ethereum dapp so is there a way i can migrate to zelika easily okay so it, it it all depends on um, let's say two two factors one is um, the high level language and the other one the other one is the evm byte code yeah right yeah so uh, at the high level language we, we can be as close to as close to let's say solidity if you want in terms of in terms of language so you know if you have written a solidity contract it should be easy for you to port it directly to to the new language that you will have mm-hmm. high level we are also going to have i mean our plan right now is that uh, we will have very similar op codes you know probably just as you know you'll just remove a few op codes from from evm in general it's going to be the same as evm uh, right now so developers won't have much issues in importing or you know moving from ethereum to okay okay got it um i'm just curious can you talk a bit about like uh, so what happens in ethereum is like uh, on the blockchain when we put a smart contract it gets stored and it's a very simple architecture it's like a normal single threaded blockchain and uh, if you are sending a like a, if you want to do a call uh, that you you set up you go set up a node maybe you most people go through an infura node um, and uh, you reach out to the smart contract like how does that work in silica it's like for um, if if say i deploy a smart contract you said that that gets stored at all places but for the transactions and um, like uh, how does that architecture work out okay so yeah the the transaction so if you know let's say contract account as in ethereum has a bunch of fields and one of those fields is is the contract code mm-hmm. so i mean not not exactly contract code but you know in, to some extent that's what you store hash hash of it mm-hmm. so you will have the same architecture so every node will store everything but when you send let's say send a transaction and you want to invoke a certain function you know in a in a certain smart contract that you know that uh, computation will happen in a specific shard so not every shard will run that computation okay. let's say i i'm in a shard i'm i'm in a shard, i'm a shard node i will process that computation and eventually once i have reached consensus on the final state of the contract what i will do is i will just kind of inform other shards that look this is the final state of the system and you accept it so okay. not every node in other shard will have to process or run that contract okay got it so uh, okay okay now i got it so it's like uh, each one shard will do the competition and it will tell the other shards to get updated exactly, exactly. that's 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 the that's the idea Okay, okay, got it, got it. So, uh, can you talk about like some sample applications that are getting built on top of Zilliqa, and like what would get built on top of Zilliqa in the future? Okay, so um, we are we are a very scalable pl- blockchain platform. So, I mean, if, if I mean, you can actually build any application that you can think of that you are kind of building on Ethereum, and you can suddenly build on Zilliqa, and you will get let's say advantage in terms of scalability. what we trying to do right now is is target a few applications that actually require very high throughput and that can actually you cannot run those applications on let's say existing platforms because of you know scalability and throughput limitations mm-hmm. and one of those applications is digital digital advertising so um digital advertising is something that's that's very popular you know it's, it's one of the biggest markets right now with bigger players big very big players like google and facebook getting involved in mm-hmm. and um but you know there are a lot of issues that these uh, you know and and uh, digital advertising application faces in a real world you know like there are a lot of third party players they take a cut out of it you know um, at the end of uh, the you know the ecosystem you have this publishers and publishers don't get enough money and advertisers they don't get you know they don't have a good sense of whether their campaign has been successful because of ad fraud and things like that so you feel that blockchain is one applic- is one platform where these applications can be built and they can actually give very very nice nice uh, properties and uh, can give very very you know powerful guarantees for that application but the problem is that you cannot run that application on, on existing platforms because of scalability you know digital advertising in general requires around 1 billion transactions per second even if you pick any blockchain platform you and even if you decide that that blockchain platform is only going to process transaction related to digital advertising even then you won't be able to handle the traffic so digital advertising we feel that is is an application that we we want to build on on zelica 
and we have a partner uh, which is called mindshare and we are trying we are partnering with them to understand the requirements and the problems that we have to solve and then you can, you can build uh, an application for them okay so how 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 would the uh, flow book look like like you 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 would el- eliminate the uh, like the middleman like some like the google like if the advertisement advertiser maybe say wants to advertise he would directly pay to the content creator and you you could have that or you could also have a let's say you could have a smart contract for let's say advertisers one smart contract for publishers and one smart contract for let's say the ad exchanges which okay. kind of handle bidding and things like that so you you could have this model as well and um, you know then then you eliminate all those middlemen that you know kind of sell you ad spaces in the name of publishers so that it will be more transparent like it will, it will become much more transparent uh-huh. and you can audit uh, transactions and you know everything that happened on the uh, got it so um just one more point it's like uh, do you think that um, so i am a developer as well i think about what we can build on top of blockchains um so like we see people building decentralized linkedin decentralized twitter um, all these applications do you think that these applications would eventually like get built on blockchain maybe say their data is the data uh, is stored on the blockchain instead of or maybe something like ipfs or and the hash is stored on the blockchain i do think that blockchain has a lot of potential um, in building um, you know i mean blockchain is now like internet right you know previously when internet was there you know they be be essentially used for use it for you know transferring files and html but now you have all these applications like facebook linkedin and all these interesting applications i do feel that blockchain has potential for that to to bring all those all those applications on blockchain and it will give you a lot of benefits but yeah there are certain challenges that have to be solved and one of those challenges is is certainly uh, uh, scalability but there are other other ones as well like privacy you know you don't want to put every linkedin i mean you kind of trust to some extent link linkedin you know yeah. back in service provider but you don't want to trust every single node that's there on in the public network right so you need to build some kind of privacy preserving or privacy enhancing solutions for that so we have to we have to think about all those problems and then we can certainly bring those applications on blockchain yeah and like say for the internet we have um, we have like applications that no one would have thought about like uh, like say 95 or 2000 uh, do you think that something similar would happen with blockchain like uh, the applications that we can't even think about would come to life in the future well one application that actually happened was erc20 and ico right you know yeah. it was so hard for people to let's say contribute i mean so hard for a normal person to kind of contribute you know in terms of um, in terms of uh, funding a project there was kickstarter but you know yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this model gave you a very different different uh, economy and now you, you you could say that you know there's a lot of there are a lot of people who are interested in in going after this model mm-hmm. so i i personally feel that it's a very good application of blockchains but yeah we have to look beyond that if i had a very killer idea i would have implemented myself on on zelica yeah. uh, unfortunately i do not ha- i don't have a very good idea right now but you know i'm i'm waiting for bright minds out there in the blockchain space to come up with even more and better applications that yeah. that was it yeah got it got it um yeah uh, okay thanks amrit it was great talking to you about zelika and uh, i loved your insights uh, about the whole space um yeah thanks a lot for coming up thank you thank you it was great talking to you to you as well thank you okay